All right. So I'm going to start out uh, like a real mathematician uh, with this commutative diagram. Uh, this just explaining the concept of equivariance. So equivariance just means that you have uh, some kind of object or a function on some kind of object, which uh, it can suffer two types of transformations. One of the transformations is uh, denoted in the here by phi, which is this mapping from one space to another. And the other transformation denoted by the t by t of g is uh, more like an internal transformation corresponding to the action of a group. In our case, typically some kind of symmetry group like rotations in space or permutations, that sort of thing. And then equivariance just means that this uh, <coughs> uh, phi transformation commutes or more generally intertwines with this group action. So what, what that means is that if you take your object and uh, you uh, and then you let the group do its thing to it first and then you apply the phi mapping, then you're going to get exactly the same answer as if you applied the phi mapping to the original object and then the transformation according to the group uh, is uh, happens in the in the in 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 the uh, transformed space so of course in our context this phi is going to be the whole neural network so we're going to be learning something something about physics and what what we were trying to enforce is that that something needs to be invariant with respect to say uh, changes of coordinate system in your space or it needs to be equivariant in the sense that say you're learning a vector valued quantity you know everything really needs to transform as vectors in particular the answer needs to transform according to the same transformation as your inputs to the neural network so equivariant neural networks are just a class of neural networks which somehow have this kind of property baked in so this talk is going to be about how to actually achieve that how to construct neural networks which are going to guarantee this equivariance property for you. So of course uh, physical laws in general are equivariant to, uh, to the symmetries of nature. So here is an example uh, for some reason I, I decided to uh, illustrate this with the Navier-Stokes equation which uh, has lots of different terms on the left hand side you see uh, the essentially the force acting on a particle of fluid uh, moving with the rest. And on the right hand side, of course, it's affected by the gradient and pressure. Then it's affected by this viscosity and so and the outside forces and so on and so on. But the key thing is that each of these terms, uh, if you just rotate your coordinate system or you rotate your experimental apparatus, then e each of these terms is going to change, but it's going to change in the same way. And you can go through every term, look at the individual uh, factors in that term and figure out how that happens. So for example, this uh, time derivative term du by dt, of course, that's just a vector. So if you rotate the current system, then it's just going to get multiplied by the rotation matrix. Now you have this other term, this kind of convection term, uh, then you need to look at both the grad u part, which actually transforms in a more complicated way because uh, it transforms like a matrix. So it's, it's, a, it's a, um, uh, it, it, it is acted on both on the left and the right by the orthogonal matrix. Um, but then when you dot that together with u itself, then one of these uh, actions is going to get canceled out. And overall you end up with something which again just transforms as a vector, okay? So, um, this sort of uh, the, the, this uh, this is like a fundamental property of nature that uh, that that uh, physical laws need to obey uh, symmetries, and it's a kind of organizing principle of uh, uh, of of uh, physics and consequently of of, of uh, the other sciences, and in fact is often a very big clue in terms of discovering new laws of nature, uh, starting with the the underlying symmetries which we know a priori must be satisfied. A lot of the 20th century physics is kind of riffing off from this principle and extending it in you know, uh, uh, more abstract and wild dimensions. 
uh, talking about symmetries to kind of in internal symmetries of elementary particles, for example. Okay, so the question is how do, do these ideas mesh with the neural networks? Because neural networks are very popular, everybody is trying to use them for uh, uh, for modeling physical interactions, but then how do you make the neural networks respect the same sort of uh, symmetries? Okay, so the neural network, you want, I want you to have something for now very simple in mind, like what you have, see on the right hand side. So it's just kind of this information processing system where you have the individual uh, units called the neurons, which communicate with each other. They're often uh, organized in layers. Uh, the, what you have on the right hand side is a fully connected network, but that does not necessarily need to be so. And in general, what happens is that each of these uh, individual neurons, they receive inputs from the layer below, and then they do something with that to compute their output. And that something uh, is often as simple as taking a weighted linear combination of the inputs and then applying a nonlinearity. So for our purposes, what's critical is that, it, is that uh, the operation consists of these two parts. First, the linear part, uh, which, uh, however, has learnable parameters. In particular, you often learn the weights with which you uh, combine these different inputs. And then some kind of nonlinearity, because if there was no nonlinearity, then the whole thing would be linear and, uh, and uh, kind of boring. Okay. So in this context, equivariance just means that if... Uh, there's a specific way in which the inputs to the network transform. Um, and there's a specific way that you want the output to transform. Then, you know, when the, uh, then these two are going to correspond. So if F in is transformed to TG of F in, where T just describes this action and G is the group element, then uh, the output F out must, must transform according to T dash of uh, corresponding to the same group element G. So say the same rotation or same permutation or something like that. By the way, I'd really appreciate it if uh, when something is not clear or you have comments, then you would just interrupt me. I know it's a bit intimidating over, over uh, a Zoom. I can assure you that giving a talk over Zoom is only more intimidating. Okay, so at the kind of very mechanistic level, we just want to figure out how to make these neurons uh, a be behaving in this way. So at the, we want to figure out the rule or the, the behavior of individual neurons so such that when they receive these inputs F1, F2, F3 and produce the output F out, then um, when you transform the inputs, then the output is going to transform in a coordinated way, kind of the appropriate, the appropriate prescribed way that we want from them. So this is what the whole talk is going to be about. So one example where this sort of thing is critical and uh, an area that uh, we have also contributed to is uh, learning force fields for say molecular dynamic simulations. So literally that's a problem of learning a vector valued quantity, the force on a given atom as a function of the positions of our neighbors. It's very natural in this sort of problem to have a hierarchical decomposition of the neighborhood, kind of similar to how physics in general likes to decompose problems into the constituent parts. And uh, then make these individual parts be our abstract kind of neurons. So this information is going to flow from these smaller parts, the larger parts, slightly larger parts, and so on and so on. And at the end of the day, it's going to tell us what the force on the central atom is. However, this whole thing needs to be equivariant. So if you rotate, if you just move around the, the, the surrounding uh, uh, atoms, say you rotate the whole system, then that means that the representation of each of these subsystems needs to co transform correspondingly. And whatever means you have to describe the relative positions of the subsystems that also needs to, to transform uh, correctly. Uh, because that's the only thing that's going to guarantee that what you get out at the end, the force on a central atom, this uh, transforms uh, the right way according to rotations or translations or whatever symmetry you want to impose on the system. So one of the questions that, uh, I'd, <laughs> that always comes up and I can kind of preempt with this example is why is this so important anyway if we have enough data? So it's true that, um, that uh, in some cases in machine learning, the approach to dealing with symmetries is to kind of ignore them 
hope for the best with saying that, well, actually, if symmetry is so important is so and is so apparent in the data, then our magical uh, machine learning algorithm is going to figure it out itself. I don't need to worry about how to uh, put it in explicitly. So to some extent, this, um, this might be true. However, this molecular dynamics example is, uh, is, a, is a typical case when this kind of attitude becomes very dangerous. Because um, if you do not get the energies in your, in your simulation exactly right, or the magnitude of the force, well, maybe that's not the end of the world. But really, if you try and build an entire molecular dynamics simulation on a force field, which does not uh, respect rotation equivariance, then the trajectories that you're going to get out are just completely crazy. So you can really like, uh, um, uh, it's a slightly different uh, than making an error on identifying some objects in YouTube videos with a certain probability. That's kind of, that, that's bad, but that's not quite, this, not quite as bad as violating energy conservation in a physical simulation. So if possible, Pre I prefer simulations which uh, 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 actually respect the underlying principles of nature. Okay, so the natural place to start in uh, talking about these equivariance neural networks is actually to talk about a much more standard and, uh, 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 and, and all the technology, which is just convolutional neural networks. So, uh, uh, <laughs> Um, it's not possible to talk about convolutional neural networks without talking about this character on the right hand side of the of the slide, because that's indeed the area where they have uh, met the great success in identifying in in, in a computer vision, ident object recognition uh, uh, in particular, such as uh, the famous problem of identifying cats and images and uh, videos. This is not just any cat, by the way. This is Nvidia's cat, so I need to acknowledge that. All right, so um, convolutional neural networks uh, have, have follow the same sort of feed forward uh, uh, principle that I, that I mentioned a couple of slides back, but uh, what's special about them is that the connectivity between the different layers and the weights between the neurons and the different layers are constrained in a specific way so that effectively what happens is that What's computed at each level of the of the of the network is just the convolution of the output of the previous layer with a with a uh, learned function. So com by convolution, I really mean the kind of classical signal processing uh, notion of convolution that you see at the bottom of the of the slide here. Okay, so this involves first of all this involves two things. First of all. Uh, these convolutions tend to be spatially restricted. So it's not going to be true that every neuron in one layer is connected to every neuron in the previous layer. They're only related, they're only connected to neurons in the similar sort of spatial uh, position, say this, this small square around each point. And in addition, the, the weights are shared across the entire layer. So the way that the one neuron is uh, connected to the neuron just below it is the same as any other neuron and the, and the neuron below it. So that rule is going to guarantee that the, uh, that the action of the, of the neural of a given layer actually is a convolution. Okay. So then if this, is, if this is how the neural network is set up, then the weights of the neural network really just correspond to this function that you convolve with, i.e. in signal processing language, the filter. Okay. So uh, this simple architecture has some really fundamental consequences and is, a, is actually uh, uh, really critical to why convolutional neural networks have been so, have been so robustly successful, in particular at uh, uh, computer vision tasks. So one thing that's, uh, uh, that one consequence is that, is that if you look at not just one layer, but several of these la layers stacked together, and you look at how information flows, I mean, when exactly what, in the, what is going to influence what, what else in the high layers, then you discover that this automatically, you have this hierarchical structure. So these, uh, if you look at the uh, receptive fields and the zones of influence of individual neurons, individual layers, and you stack them together, then they are going to form these pyramids. 
and with meaning that higher up you are going to have neurons that are sensitive to larger areas of the original image but uh, the previous layers are going to kind of pre-process those uh, uh, those areas in the image for you in terms of more localized uh, um, uh, more lo more localized filters so in terms of uh, in terms of uh, uh, what you expect of how semantics comes through in, in vision, this actually is a very natural and desirable property. The other thing is that, that it is automatically given to you by this convolutional structure is exactly equivariance. So because these weights are shared across the whole neural network, if you look at what one, this kind of hierarchy of filters does to one patch of an image and another patch of the image, it's going to be exactly the same. So if you take your image and just translate it, then uh, in the second layer, the activations are going to translate exactly the same way, in the third layer, exactly the same way, and so on and so on, meaning that, uh, essentially meaning that if your task is, for example, object recognition, then you're not going to be biased towards recognizing objects in a particular part of the of the image, you're going to be equally get good at rec equally good or equally bad at recognizing the same thing anywhere. Okay, so as uh, so this is translations, but you might say that okay, translations is not everything. There are other natural symmetries of images. For example, there's symmetry with respect to rotations. So in order to uh, in order to encode that in your neural network, you need to do a little bit more, a bit more work because uh, rotations are going to both kind of shuffle the pixels around in your images and they're also going and if your filters are directional so if, for example if you have something that picks up on just vertical edges or horizontal edges then it's actually going to permute these filters amongst themselves so a neural network which also respects rotational equivariance is called a steerable uh, neural network and this has a long history in uh, uh, this notion of steerable filters has a long history in computer vision and neuroscience, uh, but in the deep learning uh, literature in particular, it was uh, reintroduced uh, by uh, by Cohen and Welling in 2017. Okay, but this is the key thing to realize is that although these concepts are classical, they are just special cases of this general notion of equivariance, uh, group equivariance, in this case, equivariance with respect to translations and rotations. Okay, so this is just a couple of slides uh, stolen from Rip Fergus's paper a couple of years back on what features a neural network trained in one of these standard image data sets actually picks up on. So this, uh, what they did here is that they trained a neural network in the entire data set and then they looked that what patches of uh, what image patches from the original data set particular neurons respond more strongly to. And what you see is that in the first few layers of the neural network, uh, it picks up on these very on these relatively simple features like just edges or ridges or maybe little curves. And then in the higher levels, that kind of puts that together. Uh, puts these lower level features together into something a bit more interesting and what's astonishing is that uh, very early on so here even on in, um, on in, in just the fourth layer you're starting to see neurons which seem to be specialized to recognizing very specific things like uh, dog faces okay so uh, uh, the claim is that this is not the, the neural network's ability to do this is not independent of this convolutional kind of equivariant architecture underneath. So the talk, uh, so this this talk that I'm giving now is going to be about generalizing this to things other than just images and other than just translation and rotation in 2D to the more interesting and slightly more abstract groups that uh, come up in physical uh, systems. So right, any question? Somebody got a question? Uh, okay. So so the first concept that we're going to need to need for this is the notion of group representations. So I expect that this is all familiar to the mathematicians and the physicists in the audience, but not necessarily to everybody. Uh, so just to remind you, uh, I'm going to give a very uh, informal definition here. Uh, 
So to me, a group representation is a way of modeling a group in terms of matrices. Okay, so a group is, in, in, in general, it's a pretty abstract object, right? It's determined, it's just a set of uh, elements and an operation on them uh, defined in some way. Um, it can be something like rotations in which that comes, it already is defined in terms of matrices, but not necessarily. So the way mathematicians talk about uh, about groups, they just they they are like this elementary uh, notion of uh, structure, uh, and uh, in and um, it is and then which is, but by itself is not easy to easy to uh, to, to imagine or to, to or to model. So uh, uh, group representation is a literally just assigns a matrix to every group element with the constraint that the matrices need to multiply the same way as the group elements do. So it's just a way of modeling the group with matrices. And the matrices can be of different sizes. So you can choose the dimensionality of your representation. You can have simple sort of low dimensional representations, but you can also have representations in terms of very high dimensional matrices. Okay, so it's this correspondence, it's a, technically it's a homomorphism from the group onto the, uh, to the set of uh, invertible, uh, actually comp square complex matrices. So the reason that group representations that come, uh, are, uh, we cannot avoid talking about group representations here, is that in practice, when a group starts doing something, as in it starts acting on our images or our molecules or something, then the way it, as long as that action is linear, it's kind of crazy if it's not linear, but so, so everybody, everybody that is in this field only considers linear actions, but the linear action itself is a group representation. So very quickly, you end up talking about how these group rep, what the group representation is, how it possibly breaks down into smaller representations, and uh, how that's going to correspond to things inside your neural network. Okay. So the thing with group as so a group representation theory is an area of math, and we're not going to be discussing it much here. But the thing about it is that it's actually a very well developed area. So in terms of creating your neural network to respect a particular symmetry, you can just refer to the appropriate uh, book in the, in the library, and it's going to tell you everything you need to know about the representation of that group, like how many representations there are, what they are, how to compute them, what the relationships between them, and so on and so on. So for example, in simple cases, there's just the three-dimensional rotation group. And of course, as I said, the rotation matrices, the so orthogonal matrices themselves form a, a representation of, of that group. But uh, in fact, there is an infinite sequence of these irreduce, so-called irreducible representations indexed by the a number L. And for, for, for uh, uh, as it so happens that the irreducible representation corresponding to L is going to be exactly 2L plus one dimensional. For the physicist in the audience, this is probably already ringing all sorts of bells with the uh, quantum mechanics and the irreducible representations of FCU2 and SUN in general and so on and so on. So those are all very valid and relevant uh, connections. But you can also do the same thing even for a finite group. So for example, if you consider permutations, then the n factorial different permutations of n objects form a group called the symmetric group of order n. And uh, the representation theory of that is also well studied. Uh, it uh, weirdly, it turns out that the irreducible representations are then uh, indexed by these, these things called young diagrams, like uh, consisting of putting these boxes and boxes down and then uh, conforming to strange rules and subs in, 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 in these kind of Tetris shapes. So each Tetris shape has a corresponding irreducible representation. So if you want to do something with the symmetric group and you want to build a neural network that, that respects that sort of symmetry, at least formally, you need to worry about all that. Okay. So uh, back to neural networks and, uh, and, uh, uh, and equivariance, a very simple theorem is that um, uh, is, uh, is what I already uh, I've actually mentioned just before, is that whenever you're in a situation that some layer of your neural network, or even some part of your neural network, transforms in a prescribed and linear way according to your symmetry group, then uh, 
that transformation must in fact be a representation, not necessarily reducible, but a representation of the underlying group. So it must be expressible. For now, we're only talking about a finite dimensional case. So these are finite, it's a neural, after it's a neural network, so you have finite dimensional vectors, you have linear operations on them, i.e. you have matrices. And of course, if you apply one transformation and another transformation, then the corresponding matrix must be the same as the product of the transformation corresponding to the third, the, trans, the matrix corresponding to the third transformation multiplied by the matrix corresponding to the second transformation. So it is a representation. So um, already we've somehow landed in this land of uh, representation theory. So all that we need to figure out, so now that we've established this, all that we need to figure out is what the neuron is going to be allowed to do. So if we know that the inputs transform according to a particular representation like row one, and the output needs to transform according to another representation, say row two, then what uh, can what is the neuron going to be allowed to do uh, so as to make sure that uh, uh, that these transformation rules are not violated? Okay. And uh, following the way I talked about uh, about uh, neural nets in general, we are going to be examining this in two parts. First, we're going to be able we're going to look at the linear part, and then we're going to uh, look at the nonlinearity. Okay. Any questions at this point? Anything to clarify? Yeah, right. well, maybe just before you scream on, uh, maybe go back one slide and just give us an example, like, uh, uh, I don't know, rotations of colors in, uh, in a color wheel or, or just something really, really, really simple of what the transformation is and uh, explain what the row and everything like that is. Um, yeah, so actually, one of the most natural examples is what I started with, that is that learning some, something like a vector-valued function uh, for a physics application. And there the transformation, the, the, the symmetry group is the group of rotations, okay? And, uh, and uh, uh, so correspondingly, these, this row is going to, as I said, is going to be one of these sets of Wigner matrices. So in this, the, actually the simplest case is that, they, and that you, 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 the, the, the internally the neural network just propagates three-dimensional vectors, in which case the row would just be orthogonal matrices. So that's very simple, right? So the, what the neuron gets is a bunch of three-dimensional vectors and what it outputs is also a three-dimensional vector or several three-dimensional vectors. However, that's not quite, and that's not quite the whole story. So there are other, uh, other quantities which transform linearly with respect to rotations. In particular, if you, have, if you look at the spherical harmonic expansion of something uh, for, for a given L, then this vector of spherical harmonic coefficients, say you want to do like, like fast multiple, like uh, actually Jason mentioned, or uh, anything else involved, or, or anything else involving uh, or a spin in physics or anything else involving expanding things in terms of uh, kind of rotation order, then that's going to transform according to the corresponding, uh, uh, the corresponding uh, uh, irreducible representation of the rotation group. So, um, in, in, so in, in physics applications, you really need to be mindful of you know, what quantities are scalars, what quantities transform Accord, like um, like as, as like spin, what transfer quantities transform, like three dimensional vectors and so on and so on. So I intentionally don't go, want to go into actually writing down these uh, irreducible representation matrices and so on and so on. They just involve a lot of impressive algebra, but not necessarily very intuitive. Okay. So. Um, so let's uh, talk about this uh, first, the linear part of the transformation. So we are going to conceive of these, these uh, activations and transform according to the group, actually as functions on the group, because that's exactly what happened in the, in the uh, convolutional neural network case, right? So, the, so what is, you, the, what is that, that you have in the input or in one of the subsequent layers of a neural network, but it's just a function on this grid on R2. So it's really, if you make it continuous, it's actually a function on the plane. 
So what the neural network does is that it, it uh, transforms one function on the plane to another function on the other plane and so on and so on. So most generally, we can look at the activations in this group back where a neural network similarly is a function on the group or um, the, the details will come a bit later. Actually, on, a, on what is called a homogeneous space or a quotient space, the group divided by some subgroup of it. Okay. And then, uh, and we saw that in the case of, uh, uh, in, of, of, of CNNs, the, what the, uh, the, the group, what the network actually implements in each layer is just convolution with a learned filter. Now, it turns out that there's a generalization of the notion of convolution to groups as well, even non-commutative groups, which looks exactly the way that you would expect it to look. So you can see on the right-hand side that instead of x minus v, v, you just have, you just evaluate f, uh, you just have two group elements, u and v, and you evaluate f at u times v inverse, okay? Because that's like the analog of, of uh, minus on a, on a general group, okay? And integration, it turns out that there's a natural uh, measure to integrate with respect to on uh, at least compact groups called the Haar measure, so that uh, so the so uh, so that dilemma is taken out of the picture as well. Okay. So the first uh, kind of uh, reassuring kind of anchor in this whole field is this theorem that actually we, we proved a couple of years ago, which says that as whenever you have a equivariant network of the simple kind of feed forward type, uh, um, which has these inter interwoven uh, uh, linear and nonlinear operations, then the linear operation must in fact be one of these generalized uh, group convolutions. So this is a, this is a very nice that uh, this whole idea of convolutions just generalizes directly, in this case, to any compact group. So that covers uh, things like rotation groups and other compact lead groups, as well as any finite group like the permutation group. Um, and similarly to the, to the CNN case, this means that the, what you can learn in your neural network are going to be these uh, filters, which now are functions on the group, but never mind. It's something that, that's a well-defined quantity and, uh, you, and uh, 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 you can learn it and uh, this whole architecture is going to guarantee equivariance for you. All right, so Let's this be a little bit too abstract at this point. Um, I can give you a specific example, both of uh, the group action and the homogeneous spaces and also what convolution means. So imagine that you want to do the same sort of thing as before in convolutional neural networks. I learned, learned something about images, but in a way that behaves nicely with respect to translations on the images. But now the images are painted on the sphere. So this is kind of a spherical object recognition task, which actually comes up in all sorts of applied areas and robotics and elsewhere. So uh, there, what is the group? The group is just the rotation group. What is the space on which the functions are defined? Well, now it's the sphere. So the sphere is not the same as the rotation group. It's one of these quotient spaces. Actually, the sphere is the rotation group divided by the, just the, uh, the uh, SO2, so the two-dimensional rotations, it turns out. And uh, now you want to be equivariant. We went to, uh, to the full rotation group in this case. How do you achieve that? Well, of course, the way you achieve that is that you take the correlation between your input image and uh, these filters that your network learns, which you are now allowed to move around on the surface of the sphere. And you're also allowed to rotate uh, uh, around its, its center point. Okay, so there's a, this leads this natural notion of uh, convolution or correlation on the sphere, and actually, uh, this corresponds directly to this more abstract group theoretical, um, the, the more abstract group theoretical terms that I was talking about in the previous slide. Okay. Now, the other component is the nonlinearity, and. Uh, uh, what is the kind of nonlinearity that people use in the, in, in the classical case and let's say convolutional neural networks? It's, well, it's something, just something like a ReLU. So really what it is, it's just the pointwise nonlinearity. You have this uh, F uh, pre-activation, which uh, you get from the linear uh, 
uh, which you get from the linear transformation. And you just pointwise apply some transfer function like this uh, cutoff absolute value function uh, to get your output and make sure that the transformation overall is nonlinear. Now, it turns out that you can do exactly the same on a group. So you just have a function of the group or on the sphere, this homogeneous space, and then you apply the ReLU to that and you, and you, and you, and, and then in some sense you are fine. Okay. So this is all very good, but uh, it does have a little bit of a, uh, at least a computational drawback. And that is that what I just described requires doing all these operations on, like it re essentially requires quadrature on the group, right? So you need to define everything on the group or, or just you know, on the homogeneous space or something like the sphere. And you need to compute these integrals over these weird space, weird curved spaces. And you need to apply this nonlinearity. There are lots of uh, opportunities for numerical error to creep in. And uh, also the whole uh, computation is, is, is certainly not as, uh, well, it doesn't exactly mesh as well with say, uh, uh, graphics processor architectures as the kind of uh, relatively pedestrian uh, matrix and vector operations that machine learning people are used to. So the next part, uh, which I think is maybe the most important part of the most interesting part of this whole story is how we can actually get around all these issues simply by going to Fourier space. So now we take our poor cat, but now the cat is going to be in Fourier space, okay? So the reason that uh, this is uh, at all possible is because actually Fourier transformation has a direct analog on groups. And you can kind of figure out what it's going to look like just by writing down the ordinary Fourier transform and staring at it and thinking about uh, what, uh, how you would generalize it to when instead of being on the real line or the plane or in a D-dimensional Euclidean space, you happen to be on a group, okay? So this is the answer. <clears throat> so just like in the classical case, it's an integral <coughs> over the group, uh, according again to the standard measure, the harm measure on the group, weighted by something. But instead of weighting by uh, these uh, by the, by by these complex exponentials, here you are weighting by surprise surprise by the by the, by the irreducible representations of the group. There's some noise in the background, which may be bothering you. So I'm actually going to go inside. Mm -hmm. All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> so, um, um, in so many ways, this is kind of reassuring that there's such a, a simple analog of Fourier transformation in groups. On the other hand, it's a little bit weird because if you think about what's on the right-hand side, well, I just told you that these representations, these rows are matrix-valued functions, right? So this means that these, va these integrals are also matrix-valued. So you take, when you're on a non-commutative group, what happens is you take out, uh, you start with a nice and honest function on the group, you do the Fourier transform, and what comes out is not a function in a group, but this bunch of matrices, like one matrix corresponding to each irreducible representation. So I admit that this is a little bit uh, weird. On the other hand, this generalized Fourier transform still um, uh, respects many of the nice properties of uh, Fourier transformation from the classical domain. In particular, it's going to obey the convolution theorem. So I told you what convolution on the group is. And of course we know that uh, in, the in the classical case, uh, the convolution is diagonalized in Fourier space, i.e. the convolution of two, the Fourier transform, the convolution of two functions uh, is uh, the, the, just the product of the Fourier transforms of the individual transform, uh, Fourier transforms. Now this exact same property also holds in this non-commutative case, except what you have on the right-hand side now is of course matrix multiplication. So uh, from a computational point of view, from actually having to do this in, your, in TensorFlow or something to train your neural network, this is already way more attractive uh, to than doing that integral over the entire group because it tells you that all that you need to do in order to compute these uh, convolutions 
for the linear part of your neural network layers is just essentially multiply matrices, which these packages are actually really good at. Okay, so similarly, equivariance, which look, which uh, corresponds to the action of translations on a function in Fourier space, has a really nice form in Fourier space. It's just going to correspond, and then the, uh, uh, in the non-commutative case as well, it's just going to correspond to multiplying the Fourier matrices from the left by the corresponding representation matrix. Okay, so now we can rephrase our uh, theorem for uh, uh, what the linear layer in the neural network is allowed to do in Fourier space. And it looks much, it's much simpler. So all that's going to uh, tell you is that actually these activations, uh, one way you can look at them, of course, is a function of the group or a function of the homogeneous space, but a much easier way to look at them is just these, as just these matrices, each one matrix corresponding to each of the irreducible representations. And then the, way that uh, these uh, and that the own and that the uh, way these going, are going to transform under the linear operation what the linear operation is going to do to them is just matrix multiplication with the learned weight matrix so this fi dash equals fi wi this is actually what the neuron is going to be doing this is the wi are the actual is the actual weight matrix that the neuron learns and this is the only thing that it's allowed to do in order to guarantee that uh, equivariance is preserved. Now, what about the nonlinearity? So, previously I said that the nonlinearity has to be a, point, a pointwise function on the regional group or on the regional homogeneous space. So, you can still do that, but now you need to realize that that's going to involve backward and forward Fourier transforms all the time, going from these matrices to the function and from the function back to the matrices. So you might or might not want to do that. In some applications, that's actually fine. But, uh, uh, it, but in other applications, it's always going to be a bottleneck. So you might wonder, is there any way to, do, to then have a nonlinearity in Fourier space, which is still equivariant and not entirely trivial? And if you think about it a little bit, the, you quickly discover that the natural thing to do is to consider tensor products. So the question is, how do tensor products of irreducible representations decompose into individually irreducible representations? Fortunately, this is a kind of, this is a question that comes up in many other contexts and has been answered uh, by something called the Klebsch-Gordon decomposition. This also, also tells you, incidentally, how to add an angular momenta of different particles uh, together in quantum mechanics. So this is why it might be familiar to some of you. Okay, so anyway, so there is this magical transformation out there, which uh, working it out from scratch is not trivial, but it's a fixed transformation, fixed linear transformation. You can, uh, you can look up the transformation coefficients, which is going to take you, uh, going to take two of these, uh, uh, these, the, these uh, Fourier matrices, transforming to specific irreducible representations, take the tensor product and decompose them into another bunch of matrices, which also transform it according to individual uh, uh, irreducible representations. So it's a manifestly nonlinear transformation, yet it is equivariant. So this is actually what I would advocate for in using in your equivariant neural networks, because it's much, it, you know, it's much neater just being able to stay pure, purely in Fourier space and, uh, and applying this linear transformation. Okay. So on the whole, I've kind of given you, uh, well, uh, just the kind of the backbone of this framework for, uh, for implementing equivariant neural networks for simulating your physical system. Okay. So how, how, does, how, does, how does this go? Well, first you start with your, your problem, say learning this force on the central atom in a, uh, in a given molecular system, and you identify the symmetry group. Okay. So that might be something as simple as just the rotation group, or you might explicitly need to con consider both rotations and translations. Here, in the case of force field learning, that did not uh, actually uh, cause too much trouble because all the distances were relative distances anyway. So we kind of, kind of implicitly factor that by translations. But in other cases, you explicitly need to talk about the translations as well. Or uh, if you have a kind of, some kind of relativistic problem, for example, you might you are going to be looking at say the Lorentz group. We actually have a paper on that uh, for uh, uh, where we built a neural network for 
uh, classifying collision events or these jets and in uh, uh, in particle colliders, or when in problems which involve uh, exchangeable particles and you need to be invariant or equivariant with respect to symmetry, you would be looking at the symmetry group and so on and so on. This whole list of groups that actually come up in physics, you need to look at the corresponding. Uh, uh, corresponding irreducible representations. And then you need to define the activations in the new neural network in terms of these irreducible representations. So you're going to need to say that, okay, this neuron communicates with that neuron and is going to uh, going to send, you know, uh, three uh, vectors transforming according to this irreducible representation and five according to this irreducible representation and so on and so on. So that is a design choice, right? Like what, how are you going to capture uh, the, the relevant stuff about your problem uh, in your neural network, okay? And then you need for the final ingredient is you need to figure out what the neuron is then, then going to be allowed to do. And these operations, are really constrained by all by everything that I told you in the last 40 minutes. So you're allowed to take linear combinations of these uh, of these Fourier matrices. You're allowed to column-wise concatenate them. That's fine. You're allowed to multiply them on the right by fixed or learned weight matrices, and you're allowed to essentially you're allowed to do the Klebsch-Gordon product or higher order versions of the Klebsch-Gordon product, and that's everything. So. This is what the design of these neural networks boils down to. And we played around with this a little bit, trying to improve performance in the force field learning problem. What we ended up with, uh, at least last year, in our architecture called cormorantism is as in the bottom. It's just one particular way of combining pairs of uh, information coming from pairs of atoms in, uh, uh, in terms of both the klebsch gordon product and the, just the dot product between their activations. Okay, but clearly there is there's a lot of room to play around with this. All right, so I got, actually I'm not doing so badly on time. I've got about uh, 10 minutes. So the last part I want to talk about how this might actually look like in software, because it is possible to, to just uh, implement this. After all, this is the regular, so the same old story, right? It's just a, a bunch of uh, matrix operations that are differentiable and so on. It is possible to implement this in PyTorch or TensorFlow, the, the popular neural network libraries. And some people have done that. In particular, there's this SE3 neural network library, uh, which you can find online, uh, which interfaces to PyTorch. But there are fundamental limitations. So in order to be able to, so we found that, for example, this, this uh, architecture that I we had in the, on the previous slide for force field learning, uh, when in our naive PyTorch implementation, had real trouble uh, scaling to more than uh, to systems with more than about twenty atoms, because uh, essentially because it took uh, it took this klebsch gordon operation literally, and computed these tensor product matrices and then tried to store them on the GPU, uh, which very quickly saturated the memory, uh, uh, and that, that that being the fundamental bottleneck. Okay, so. An alternative is to kind of build your own. So that's and, and what we've been doing. We've been working on a on a flexible uh, C plus plus based framework for uh, group equivariant neural networks uh, um, for the last year or so. Okay. So this is called uh, this is called named after another type of cat. It's called Jeanette for group equivariant neural network. Okay. So at a very high level. Uh, some of the design objectives of this framework are going to be that uh, these group equivariant uh, quantities, like uh, these matrices that transform according to specific irreducible representations or collections of ma matrices, which uh, transform according to a com particular combination of irreducible representations, they are kind of fundamental types. So just like a bit, kind of a bit like, just like the doubles and floats and so on, they are fundamental types of the, of the library. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, and it, it should help people write networks that actually are equivariant because when you deal with one of these types, you're not allowed to, um, to uh, apply operations to them, which would break the equivariance. So you can add these vectors together and so on and so on. But for example, you can't individually 
fiddle with the group with the elements of these uh, in, in, in these Fourier matrices because that would mess up equivariance. Okay. Now, uh, the second thing is that we have efficient implementations for the relevant operations, in particular the Klebsch Gordon product, which avoids constructing the tensor product in the first place. So it turns out that there's a lot of structure in the trend on the Klebsch Gordon uh, product and uh, just implementing directly in CUDA gives a huge uh, saving in uh, computational efficiency. Okay. So uh, that already uh, reveals that the, the library uh, both has a CPU and the GPU backend. You can move back and forth between them. Uh, and the next component is actually technically most challenging is that um, it uh, in, is, the, is the scheduling of these operations. So it's fine to write a CUDA kernel for an operation that's essential for a neural network, but really the GPU is only able to help you much if, uh, uh, if your code has a, has a structure or your underlying problem has a structure where the, uh, where the uh, parallelism is apparent from the start. So where you really need to apply the same operation to a large number of data objects of the of same dimensions. And in these general equivariant neural networks, for example, in the case where you're learning something about molecules and, uh, but, and uh, the structure of the computation graph itself, the structure of the neural network is itself determined by the not molecule and therefore does not follow such a simple structure as you know, grid upon grid in convolutional neural networks. This kind of, uh, um, the kind of trivial parallelism is not guaranteed at all. So, uh, so then the network, so, so, the, so this, the, this library is also going to have the ability to uh, Kind of batch together operations on the fly, and it's called uh, dynamic batching, which means that in the background it collects operations and batches together in the, uh, them together in such a way as to make it easy to be uh, executed in parallel all at once at some later time on the GPU. Yeah, of course it it supports automatic differentiation like any honest uh, neural network library, and the whole thing is in C plus plus eleven. So hopefully this will also give it a uh, further uh, performance edge. It also means that uh, the currently the only interf front end interface that there is to it is in C++, um, but it's pretty natural C++ and it meshes with the rest of the language. So you can freely mix the operations from the library with a regular C++ code. So for example, this is a snippet from something that, uh, that implements something like one of these uh, force, like a, something like, like a model for a given a single layer of one of these force field learning algorithms. And uh, you see that the code is uh, pretty compact. So it just defines these uh, uh, SO3 vec and SO3 part uh, object as you would expect them or like ar arrays of these things and iterates through your uh, uh, pairs of atoms and uh, explicitly compute this Krupsch Gordon product between, uh, uh, the, the, between the, uh, the, the activations of, the, of, of, of any pair of atoms and adds them to the activation of the new layer. And uh, of course, as I said, the whole thing is differentiable. So this is the forward code, but uh, the back, but, but, but uh, uh, the code for the uh, reverse mode differentiation in the backward sweep uh, to update the parameters is generated automatically. You never have to worry about gory stuff like uh, uh, figuring out the uh, derivatives of the Klebsch Gordon product and so on. Okay, so this is this 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 is about it. Uh, I finished right on the dot. I'm very happy to answer questions. <laughs>